um, good morning to those from uh, Latin America and Caribbean. Good afternoon for participants and panelists uh, that are following us um, from Europe. Uh, we are now starting this uh, second session, uh, the second day actually, uh, from the webinar Circular Economy, Governance uh, and Scale, Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean in conversation about circular transition. Uh, before I pass the floor to um, our uh, first uh, panelists, I would like just to make uh, two quick uh, announcements. Uh, one actually was done uh, yesterday by the Ambassador Goras Rensel, uh, which is the fact that we are going to share all the presentations we had tomorrow, especially those ones in um, that were made uh, through PowerPoints, uh, slides, um, in the next few days uh, through our website. But apart from this, uh, sharing these presentations, uh, the EULAC Foundation is also committed to produce uh, an executive summary or, or a mini report from this event, which uh, hopefully we can publish um, by mid-December in uh, 15 days time. Um, a second announcement I would like to uh, make is that by the end of this uh, event today, uh, participants will be receiving uh, a feedback survey uh, directly from Zoom uh, to, in which we would like to hear um, your views, your, your opinions on, on, the, on, the, on the webinar itself, uh, because uh, we, we need this to improve our future um, events. So it's very important to count on your, on your views and, um, and feedback. So um, now uh, it's a pleasure for me um, to then introduce um, the first panel, which will be um, coordinated by um, Mrs. Ladea Godina Kosher. Um, she is an international circular economy expert, uh, speaker and moderator, founder and CEO of the Circular Change, which is one of the co-organizers of this event. Uh, she is also co-leader of the research group uh, in the uh, CE systems at the BCSSS and chair of the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. Uh, and Ladea is also the co-author of the Roadmap Towards the Circular Economy in Slovenia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Chile. She was the finalist of the Circular Leadership Award 2018 in Davos in the World Economic Forum and is featured the EU Women, women uh, for Future by the European Union Commission. So it's my pleasure then to pass the floor to Mrs. Ladea Gudina Kosher. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and warm welcome to everyone who is with us today on this second day of the Circular Economy Governance and Scale event. So what I would like to share at the very beginning is that those who were with us yesterday probably uh, noticed how fruitful and powerful event it was. And hopefully we will continue with this high spirit and with a lot of knowledge to be shared today as well. Uh, since the topic uh, that I'm going to introduce and then uh, will be also in the epicenter of the first discussion is network governance, I would like to highlight that this very event is already confirming how important network governance is, as it has been introduced yesterday by Professor Jacqueline Kramer from the Netherlands, when the public authorities are collaborating with other organizations. And I would like to express deep gratitude to all the co-organizers of this event. And I think it's worth uh, listing them once again. So we have the Slovenian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then we have EU LAC Foundation and the Partnership of Exchange for Change Brazil, Circular Change, the institute I'm representing, uh, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform and the Brazilian Center for International Relations. So this is showing that events can be done 
through the collaboration and through the participation of different stakeholders. So I would like to thank everyone and really to highlight that as something what should guide us also in the future. More people together can achieve much more than each of us alone. So let me now dive into what Professor Kramer yesterday introduced in the best possible way. So she's also the one who is uh, inspiring us with the, um, the whole story behind the network governance, as well as of the presentation of the role of transition brokers. So in my presentation, I will just briefly touch uh, those uh, things. And then in the discussion, we will highlight how transition brokers who are going to be the guests of the discussion uh, are implementing that in practice in their everyday life. So let's just briefly go into uh, the introduction of the organization that I'm representing. So the Circular Change is based in Slovenia. This is private nonprofit organization, and we are operating since 2015. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, we understand ourselves and the others as well as the best entry point for your circular economy journey. What does it mean? It means that we are not those who have all the answers, but we are those who know a lot of people around the globe who are experts in their fields and who have a lot of answers related to circular economy as well as good practices. So saying uh, this once again, the entry point for circular economy journey, why journey? Because we have learned uh, that this is something what is an ongoing process. And as Janis Potocznik nicely said yesterday, circular economy is not something new. So it is not something what appeared because it has been introduced at circular economy action plan or prior to that, uh, a, a circular uh, economy um, initiative uh, based uh, introduced in the European Union. That is something what is embedded in our economy since very beginning. We only forgot how it works. So the whole story is to remind ourselves on that, how to shift from linear, so from take, use and waste, to more circular principles again. So once we use resources, let's maintain them for as long as possible. So yesterday there was a lot of focus on that, how to manage the resources and really how to implement circular economy models and roadmaps and so on. So that is where we with uh, circular change are contributing to uh, really to embrace this change, to give focus on innovation and to nourish the dialogue. And that is what we are doing today with this event as well to enable space to exchange good practices, to hear each other and also to learn from each other. And yesterday there was uh, one panel devoted to circular economy roadmaps. That is where we are quite active, I must say. And uh, why is it so important? Not so much because of the document as such, but because of the process. Why we are working on the roadmaps and uh, the speakers and uh, those who will be present in the panel will highlight that as well. While we are working on that, we recognize those change makers, or as uh, Professor Kramer is calling them, transition brokers who are already operating on the ground. And sometimes it is more, there is more focus on business sector. Sometimes the government is more active. Sometimes uh, the uh, non-governmental association. So in every country, it is a little bit different. But this circular economy uh, roadmaps are uh, paving the way for circular transformation. And we are always willing to share lessons learned and really to collaborate with those who are working on that. And we are part of European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, the coordination group, and I'm co-chairing this for the third time together with Frick Van Eyck, who was also one of the speakers yesterday. And here you can see how actually we are a kind of a global circular economy family, really supporting each other and uh, really being willing and eager to, to share whatever we can. So because uh, there, is, there are so many opportunities and there is lack of people, not abundance of us. Uh, and uh, I would really encourage everyone uh, to, to get, to start this journey and uh, to understand that each single person can contribute to this transformation. And talking about European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, I'm kindly inviting you to check 
how you can benefit from this platform. We want to be the network of networks. Yes, we are a European platform, but as you have already noticed, we are really opening the space for all other countries as well. So uh, you can find a lot of good practices, initiatives, partners for your projects. Uh, you can contribute to the policy dialogue. You can publish your events uh, or announce your documents, your processes like roadmaps and so on. So I'm inviting you really to check it and to, uh, to use it as much as you can. And uh, with Frick Van Eyck and the team, we are organizing also a very special event during the Dubai Expo in January, where uh, we will present European good practices in circular economy. So follow us uh, 17 and 18 January in Dubai. And- uh, Ladea, I would love to see all the slides that you uh, have produced. But I can only see the first slide. So oh. I don't know if it's the same for everyone. No, no, no. I'm changing slides, but uh, thank you for this remark. So you're still at the first slide? Yes. yes. Ah. yes. ah, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, because uh, on my uh, screen, the slides are changing. So uh, maybe I can ask for help. I will yes. stop sharing and maybe. If Diego, team... can you can you share Diego? I am, I'm trying to share the screen. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. And you see, this is no collaboration. <laughs> Sister. Yes. Thank you, Beatrice, because I, I was so uh, self-confident that the slides are the same as on my yes. screen. Can, can you How confirm that now? you're looking at this at the um, different slides now? Yeah. So uh, we we uh, took this one. Yes, about circular economy roadmaps. Then we went further on to introduce uh, the next one was on uh yeah you yeah can now, now you can on. Press the... yeah so i was introducing the uh, stakeholder platform uh and here are some highlights of that and we can use the next one now yeah so th this one is uh, about Nordic circular hotspot because uh, today the event is starting uh, also in Nordic countries and there we are joining forces as well. I just wanted to highlight that, how this global family is active. And then we go to the next one, please. Here we are touching now the, um, the uh, very essence of uh, our discussion. So uh, what we used to understand as the governance was more or less public governance. So uh, what the public governance is offering us and how uh, the policy is determining our behavior or enabling business and so on. That is very nice and that's fine. And we have public governance and it will remain like that. But on the other hand, we have also the network governance. So this is the next slide, please. And that is what Professor Kramer introduced yesterday. So the network governance is based on those actors on the ground who are implementing circular economy solutions and are collaborating, of course, with the public governance. And the difference is that even if the public governance does not have all the tools or is not so proactive as we would all love to be it to be the network governance can take the role of the transition uh, on the ground so and transition brokers are those within this network who are then orchestrating the processes that are needed for this transformation and we will touch it later on next slide please so what is it about uh, we have this kind of orchestration that is uh, that can be focused uh, to to be very concrete on one particular topic like construction business for example and then you need different stakeholders who can uh, uh, contribute to the transformation to more uh, circular and sustainable constructions or it can be focused on that how to align different interests to propose uh, changes on the level of uh, the law or the incentives and so on. So this orchestration is touching all these different points. So here we have an overview of that. So from research and education, and therefore we need this knowledge as well, then of creation of preconditions, as I mentioned, to address the government, 
then social cultural changes that are so important. This is about the values, about our narrative, about our behavior, and of course, market creation. We have heard yesterday how important it is that there is demand on one side and the other solutions as well. And there was one very important remark yesterday as well, that whenever we are talking about circular economy and about uh, now this green recovery, we should keep in mind SDG 12. So this is responsible production and consumption. And based on that, what we have here, uh, we should think not just about the growth, how to produce and use more, but really how to do it much more clever and in a different way. So now to transition brokers, uh, maybe something what Professor Kramer did not, um, did not introduce yesterday, but it's important. What are those competencies? Because now we will come to the speakers and all of them have these competencies uh, of transition brokers. So it is everything from being entrepreneurial to dare to leave your comfort zone. That is very hard. Uh, to uh, be uh, not to be impatient, but to be willing uh, really to follow up with contacts, to be persistent, to excite and inspire others, because that is needed uh, very much, particularly now when we are so depressed often and we do not see the purpose. And to have this systemic approach, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Potochnik explained how important this is to have this systemic approach and to understand all the complexity. And again, to have the idea how circular economy is accepted, how to speak languages of different organizations, uh, entities from business to uh, education, to large and small organizations to the government, then to act in the collective interest and really to be professional enough to stand about the parties. It is also important because the government is changing, but this transformation is long-term and we cannot change things in one mandate. So therefore it's very important. And that is what Frick van Eyck introduced in the Netherlands, how this goes beyond the mandate. It, it is going on and also in Finland, Citra, uh, for example, how important that is that it is on the agenda, no matter who is on the government. Uh, and then to have this broad, broad knowledge base, so not to be an expert for uh, each single topic, but really to have this overview and to understand the political as well as business culture, and to be able to open doors at, at all policy levels to remove barriers. So uh, that is what transition brokers are and who they are, and these are the competencies. And now the last slide is about the situation where we are. So we are talking about green recovery. Uh, based on network governance. And it was also nicely said yesterday that it is more about sustainable recovery, not only to uh, do some greenwashing and to say that things are now green, but really to, to transform society and business, so economy in this sustainable way. And it everything is needed here. I just put it, those agendas that are now on the table in Europe, like Fit for 55, New Circular Economy Action Plan, systemic compass, new European Bauhaus. So all the ingredients are here and it's up to us whether to use them properly and also to use the money that is available as an investment or to waste it in the wrong way. So thank you uh, for listening to me. And now the most exciting part is coming. So this is the discussion. And I would like to ask now uh, the panelists to join me. And I'm introducing uh, this really, um, uh, how to say, inspiring uh, group of people uh, who is going to, to be with me now, starting with Beatrice Luce. <laughs> it's hard to introduce her <laughs> she, because she is so uh, familiar face, but she's amazing uh, as the founder of the Exchange for Change and director of the Brazilian Circular Economy Hub Brazil. So welcome, Beatrice. Then we have Guillermo Gonzalez Caballero, head of the Office for Circular Economy, Ministry of Environment Chile, a good friend as well. Without him, we wouldn't have the circular economy roadmap in Chile. Then Mr. Daniel Herrera Munoz, coordinator of the Ecuadorian Roadmap and Strategy on Circular Economy Ecuador. Miss Carolina Togar, Chair of Cradlenet Sweden, someone who is very active also in Nordic Circular Hotspot. And Juan uh, Nunez, president and CEO of Secolab Portugal. So also someone who is very much engaged in all kinds of collaboration. 
So why are we calling now uh, this uh, format like fireside chat on network governance? Because we would like to show how the conversation can be orchestrated in a different way. I will just kick off this session with the first round of questions for our panelists. But from there on, there are those active listeners and speaker who are going to ask questions to each other. And I'm encouraging also the audience, if you are willing to ask something, just share it in the chat and I will do my best to uh, include you into the discussion as well. So let's start with Beatrice. So uh, dear Beatrice, uh, I, I always admire all your work and everything what you have achieved in such a big country compared to Slovenia, where we are only 2 million people. So the first question would be, of course, how do you feel as a transition broker when you are observing the changes and the impact you with uh, your team have made uh, in Brazilian territory regarding circular economy? Wow, thank you very much, uh, Ladea, all my colleagues here in the panel. It's absolutely honor to be here, uh, sharing a little bit of our experience and being able to learn with all, with all of you. Because as Ladea always say, uh, we cannot do it alone. Uh, we need uh, this knowledge exchange, even though Brazil and Slovenia are completely uh, different in terms of size and population and culture. Uh, the more we talk, the more we see that uh, governors and uh, industries and the society are the same in all countries. So we can learn a lot from each other. And I think the, the key point here in Brazil is that um, network governance for me is about people, is about trust, and is about relationships. And Brazilian people are very much... Uh, 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 connected uh, with this approach. You know, we do business with friends, we do people, we do business with people that we trust. And the, the work that I've been doing here has been very much uh, following, you know, my drive, my belief, my mission, and bringing companies that uh, believe in my mission. So the, the Brazilian Circle Economy Hub originated with lots of former clients that I have worked individually. So uh, initiated with individual conversations. And then I came up with this idea of having an ecosystem and getting everybody to work together. Uh, the crazy that it sounds, you know, I managed to get a group of companies that believed in my mission. And I think one of the, the key messages that we've seen yesterday, we need to have this shared mission in order to, to go forward. We need a coalition of believers. So I think my work here is to build this coalition of believers, to make people believe uh, and understand the sense of urgency and the need for working together. So our crucial point was to bring large organizations and small and medium companies around the table, because we've seen that a lot of uh, events ended up with just the large organizations telling, you know, the beautiful stories and their journeys. And we wanted to be this, uh, um, this connector and the facilitator to be able to bring the voice of the small companies that most often are the solution providers bringing solution to the large organizations. And we act then uh, connecting all these people. And I think I loved when I start reading Jacqueline Kramer's book because it just all made sense. I thought that I was working in a kind of a random and, and crazy way. But when I read the competences, and especially when Ladea you know, pointed out, yeah, we need to excite, inspire, inspire, share the vision. The companies that will come and start this movement are companies that are inspired, that understand the need for the transition, but also understand that they cannot do it alone. And we also need this system perspective. And I think this is the, the, the key point of, of my work to bring this system perspective. And I'm sure that we'll have 
uh, you know, uh, uh, around this panel opportunity to share more, but it's to, to bring people together, different departments within a company that needs to understand and different companies around the value chain. And I think this is the key role of the transition broker to avoid things happening in one part of the value chain that will bring benefits, but then it will create a problem in another part of the value chain. So I think this is the role of the transition broker here in Brazil. <laughs> thank you so much. And absolutely enthusiasm is not lacking. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, as you highlighted, this system perspective is so important because sometimes we think, oh, we found a solution, but on the other uh, side, we are causing the problem at the very same time. So I will move now to Guillermo because uh, we collaborated on the roadmap for Chile and Chile is the most linear country, but is becoming the most circular regarding the economy. So can, can you share with us uh, the approach towards stakeholders? That's what Beatrice highlighted, how important it is because it was hard also in Chile and during the COVID time really to engage so many stakeholders and you did a great job. Thank you, Ladella. It's really, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation um, to share with you a little bit of our perspective from Chile. And I'll, I'll, I'll offer a perspective also not only from Chile, but also from the public sector, right? Um, which, is, which is probably different, uh, uh, a different perspective uh, to uh, Beatrice's or to some of the, uh, from uh, some of the other uh, people in the panel. Um, it's 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 very interesting to see this distinction that you just made, uh, Ladeya, between the formal versus network governance, right? Uh, formal governance, of course, as a public um, uh, uh, official, is is key. It's part of how governments work, and um, it's what you have to go through to get uh, big things happening, uh, such as new laws or regulations, etc. But what we've seen is that it is limited. It is especially limited when you want to get through transformations that will not be completed in four years. That what, that's what administrations last in Chile, right? Um, when we look at the transformation to a circular economy, we realized uh, very uh, early on that this will take us at least two decades, right? And in that sense, uh, we, we need the formal governance but we also need network governance. We also need um, all the other actors to sit on the, on the table. Why, why do we need that? It's because first we want to get the different views on, uh, in, in the different strategies, such as the, the roadmap that you just mentioned and that uh, you kindly um, uh, contributed to, to make, it, to make it better. So I, I wanna appreciate it here. Um, but, but not only get the different views, but we also want to make sure that these kinds of policies, this our, our roadmap is, um, is looking at 2040, right? Uh, how do we make sure we get to 2040 with such an instrument? Uh, we need to go through five different administrations. We, have a, uh, we had elections on Sunday. Um, we're gonna have a new administration coming in in March. Um, that's imminent, but then um, another four administrations will come in in the next 20 years. So how do we, make sure that these kinds of policies are not changed uh, uh, from one administration to the other. And we were convinced that the way to do that was to um, go for network governance. We created a strategic committee um, uh, made up of the most relevant people, the, the most relevant organizations in, in, our, in our country from academia, from the, from the public, uh, the private sector, uh, from civil society organizations and of course from the public sector. And with them, we created this roadmap uh, because most of us will be replaced by, by, new, by new people in the new administration, but the other actors will remain in their seats. And it's the other actors that will, be, that will allow these kinds of long-term policies to endure in the future. And then one, one last thing here um, related to what Beatrice just mentioned is that we, were, we, we are convinced that network governance also allows us to create social capital. Um, she talked about trust and relationships, right? Um, we have people and organizations that deeply distrust 
each other. Uh, environmentalists or, or other uh, uh, nonprofit organizations with business uh, associations, they don't always see the, uh, each other with trust. And these kind of processes are really, really important to generate, to, to it's, it's, it's impressive what happens uh, throughout the process. Uh, pe different people start really seeing that we all want to get to the same uh, outcome, but then uh, we just have perhaps different ways of, of trying to get there, you know? And in that sense, um, they are really, really valuable in that sense also. I'll stop there, Ladella, and, and then come back with more. Thank you. Thank you very much. So important messages and what you said, and I think it should be highlighted several times. It goes beyond only one administration, as you nicely said, four administrations. So how to imagine that to, to keep the topic uh, in the center? And uh, what I personally like very much, how humble you are and how inclusive. Because uh, we, we are used, you know, in a way that, uh, but it is stereotype, of course, again, that in the public center, uh, sector, there are people who, who are uh, top-down oriented and who are just giving the recommendations and so on. But you shown by your example, how inclusive and really how sensitive for the social capital you are. And that, that is our hope. Thank you so much. And we will move to another representative of the public sector now. So we are going to Daniel Herrera Munoz and uh, Ecuadorian story. Uh, it is also interesting to hear uh, what are the comparisons now based on what, what we have heard about Chile and your approach. So how is it going on in Ecuador? You did a lot, not only the roadmap, but other things as well. So please uh, share us uh, your experiences and view. Thank you, Ladella. Good morning from Quito, Ecuador. Good afternoon for all my colleagues. It's, uh, I'm very happy to be here and share with you uh, this panel. So yes, the, the experience in Ecuador, the idea of transition into a circular economy model started because of a waste management uh, problem. In Ecuador, uh, almost the 60% of waste generated is organic and only the 10% of all of waste generated is recycled. So um, traditional forms of final waste disposal, such as landfills, um, they, they are not the solution anymore. So uh, in uh, 2019, uh, some institutions were, were reunited to think about another way to, to have alternatives to resolve this problem. So uh, it passed from a, a waste management troubles to the uh, it's circular design thinking in, in, in other words. So um, with the uh, support of European Union, uh, ACRA Foundation and the uh, Ministry of Production and Ministry of Environment started this roadmap. First with the dissemination of the concept uh, with the first international seminar, um, it was um, uh, the kickoff of, of national discussions to determine governance skills to promote the circular economy transition. A few months later, we had the National uh, Pact of Circular Economy, and it brought together a national compromise in many uh, sectors of civil society. So uh, uh, we had the academy, non-government non -government, uh, organizations, uh, local and national government, industries, uh, researchers, uh, and they get this compromise to um, have an engagement of stakeholders to act for uh, any circular economy initiative in the country. In 2020, uh, and because of the national pact, uh, we had a uh, to start to think about quality standards and action for a better waste management. So uh, about, uh, with circular economy, start to think, how can we resolve this problem that was the, the first thing uh, that produced in the country to think about circular economy as a solution to these problems? So um, it was implemented the standard for project management systems with circular economy. Uh, it was created the single use plastics law and the consolidation of comprehensive material recovery systems. Um, uh, this national standards is not completed yet. 
uh, it is necessary to finish the, the quality infrastructure with uh, accredited institutions for certifying projects. Uh, the single plastics law established goals of reduction of these materials, but also implemented goals to include recover materials uh, in, in the industry. And um, the material recovery systems are very important uh, for providing industries recycled material as raw materials. And uh, they are working with used tires, for example, uh, greenhouse plastics, uh, lubricant oil, and other systems are being created for used electrical uh, appliances and packaging. Then one of the most important milestones in this roadmap uh, was uh, reached in May 20, 2021, the Circular Economy White Paper. This is a document who, uh, that uh, have action plans for four important issues, sustainable production, uh, responsible consumption, policies financing, and waste management. So uh, this document uh, have uh, many action plans in uh, and the vision of the country to 2030 to uh, reach a, a really circular economy model of production and consumption. Finally, in July 2021, the inclusive circular economy law was developed. This law uh, creates created the national circular economy system and uh, these have proposals of standards of in for industries, importers, and local governments. Um, I think the, the circul inclusive circular economy law resolves uh, the problems that Guillermo said before about the changes in public administrations. So with the law, uh, it is uh, mandatory to reach all of these standards and uh, to work together with all the stakeholders with the national circular economy system. Finally, with all of these elements, the national strategy for this roadmap for the national strategy uh, have another goals. For example, extended producer responsibility goals for prioritized materials, uh, eco design goals in products and services. So industries will have to think how to include the eco design in all forms of production, sustainable profit procurement system. I think it is the most difficult thing to, to treat in, in, in this, actually in, in the country, how to get a sustainable public procurement and circular uh, public procurement. And finally, the inclusion of uh, grassroots recyclers in local governments, systems of waste management. So this is all the, the elements that we yeah. have been working in to, to, to achieve this very, very hard roadmap. Well, we have Great. another Daniel, project. We have, have to wrap up of... because we are running out of time. <laughs> so, yes. so sorry to interrupt <laughs> no, no, you no, at no this problem. point. It was very impressive and it is nice how you shown uh, also the key milestones and also the importance of the law. Once we have the law, things are becoming easier. And we, we will come back hopefully afterwards because I have to give the word now to Carolina to guard. Sorry to, to be the watchdog no for the time, but really uh, that is also scarce resource. So Carolina, please, can you jump in on that? And because you are not coming from the public sector, but you are the one who is also one of those transition brokers uh, working on the ground in Nordic countries. Please, Carolina. Yeah, thank you. And a very impressive, Daniel. Uh, Sweden has also quite recently developed the strategy for a circular economy and also an action plan for it, uh, which we are very excited for. Uh, but well, so we're looking at the network governance uh, from my perspective or from CradleNet's perspective, uh, we focus on, on uh, like networking, collaborating with the SMEs uh, because they are many <laughs> and because many like research um, re much research that is done and so focus on large companies so we really want to see like what are what do the smes need to make their transition to a circular economy and uh, and also we see that there is a lack of, of uh, knowledge also uh, about circular economy so we're also known as being the uh, well, the organization with the latest knowledge <laughs> about circular economy. 
And so we collaborate a lot with SMEs and we also work with lobbying uh, to uh, also collaborate with the government. Um, and there we act as a voice of the SMEs uh, and let the government know what the SMEs really need. Uh, so now we are driving an expert group under the delegation of Circular Economy in Sweden to really give a concrete input to the government uh, for the next action plan, for example. Uh, and we also did um, we also did a study uh, about the challenges and opportunities of circular economy in Sweden, where we also discovered that the challenges for academia is that they're working a, a bit in silo, a bit apart from uh, businesses. So all the fantastic research that they are doing are is not really communicated to businesses. Uh, so now we have also started to collaborate more with academia and really spread the knowledge from uh, their reports as well uh, to make it like uh, much more accessible to, to companies and uh, that is really appreciated. Uh, and apart from CradleNet, we also uh, we are managing partners of the Nordic Circular Hotspot, uh, which is much inspired by the Holland <laughs> Circular Hotspot. And first, we wanted the governments in the Nordic to really initiate this uh, at the Nordic level, but no one really took <laughs> took this opportunity. Uh, so uh, we started it ourselves together with other organizations in the Nordics. Uh, and so now we have developed a digital platform uh, called the Nordic Circular Arena, where companies and networks and uh, actual individuals can meet and uh, initiate projects together, uh, publish their reports, publish like seminars, anything, uh, and find each other in the Nordic Nordics. And now we also have uh, the Nordic uh, um, uh, Circular Economy Summit. Uh, going on this week uh, to uh, well get get a more common view of the circular economy and what needs to be done in the Nordics, uh, and also to well accelerate the transition really. Um, so we see ourselves as uh, transition brokers, and uh, we think that I really liked how um, uh, Jacqueline said that um, network governance is about uh, putting policies into practice. Uh, and we really want the governance to, to realize the opportunity of collaborating with networks and with other like transition brokers that doesn't want anything less than uh, accelerating the transition and doing what's necessary for it. Thank you so much, Carolina, for this important message that it is about collaboration and it is often understood like someone should be against another, you know, but it is not about that. You so nicely introduced yeah. this uh, role of true collaboration. And as you said, this being the voice of SMEs, uh, because SMEs in Europe particularly are those who are running the economy and big companies are uh, in a smaller percentage, but to be the voice of, of SMEs discounts. And another example of what you said, like with Nordic Circular Arena uh, that you created, you are offering the platform. So you're not waiting for the government to do something, but you are the one who is the front runner. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for that. And another front runner is now from Portugal with us. Joao uh, Nunez, please, uh, your, your uh, SECO lab is also someone who is fostering this collaboration between public and private sector. So you have uh, a lot of experiences on that. Please, uh, the floor or the screen is yours now. Thank you, Ladea. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to present you to, to share my experience and share experience of the SECO Lab in this uh, great event. Uh, it's a pleasure to review Ladea, Beatriz and Boras in this event for us it's a pleasure to work uh, with the uh, america latina uh, region work with other people and uh, let me uh, let me say uh, beatrice uh, talk uh, about two important words people and trust when you talk about the partnership between the public public and private entities it's very important to create the trust between the industry and the academy and create the trust between the public sector and private sector. And for that, 
for to, to implement these actions and this type of initiatives, it's important to have the correct people. We need the people with the knowledge, with, with the uh, correct uh, uh, profile to uh, put in uh, action this type of entities. Uh, some examples, Secolab is a collaborative laboratory towards a circular economy, uh, has uh, two years of work at this moment and represent uh, more or less 5 million euros of investment from public and private sector. So in two years, we have a, a 5 million euros of investment. It's uh, really a good taking account the dimension of uh, Portugal. So uh, for this entity, we create a bridge between academy and industry. So the or um, goal is development technology, transfer technology for the market. So we com complete life cycle invention. We scale up the technology from the academy and scale up for the market. But uh, we, we take uh, in account in intention is uh, it's not possible to uh, do all of uh, technologies. We need the focus of the technology with must uh, uh, needs for the market and uh, um, answer of the uh, procurement of the industry. So um, at this moment, the, the next challenge is create the bridge between not only Portugal in the um, uh, micro scale, but increase the bridge between a macro level. At this moment, you have a real cooperation with other regions. Some, uh, one some example is from Brazil, from Beatriz and the, the Innovation Hub of Circular Economy. We are work at the global level. Why we are work at a global level? Because the, uh, it's, a, it's a, an example. Europe, it's more a consumer and other regions are more generate natural resource. So when, when you see for the value chain, the consumers, some, some parts of the value chains, the consumers are in different regions of the natural resource. So we, we, we need to create a global bridge and cooperation because we want, when we talk about circular economy, we will talk about a global challenge. With the, the consumers and the generation of natural resources are in different regions. So we need to create the value for the whole value chain, not only for a specific part of the value chain. It's a challenge. So in this part is uh, other um, uh, skills and contents of, and the um, idea of the Seco Lab is create the bridge between Europe and uh, between uh, different entities of the of the Europe, like they have a very good example of the platform of the circular economy in Europe. It's a very good entity and very important for this type of challenge, and work uh, with other regions. And of course, Latin America and Caribbean regions is a must and one of the most important regions of the generation of natural uh, resource. So. Um, we have uh, two different ways important. At a micro scale, it's for between the symbiosis between industries. At a macro scale, we need cooperation between the different regions. It's a different challenge. It's a very big challenge, but we need to, to put this in action. I think that it's possible. Do you see in my screen? It's not everything impossible. Everything is possible. <laughs> yes, okay. everything is possible if uh, the people want if it's possible. And this is my final uh, phrase, frame is in, in fact, it is possible if you, we have the people and the trust to construction this bridge and the cooperation at the global level. Thank you for this message. And we can see the circle because Beatrice started with people and trust and now you conclude it with people and trust. So it's all about that. Everything what we highlighted and touched in between relates to that. And as you said, it's so important to have this big picture 
of the globe of our one only beautiful planet because we do depend on each other. And as Potocnik said again, we are more interdependent and interconnected than ever. So this, what you are doing and your mindset is absolutely encouraging us to work in this way. And now I'm giving two words to you. So uh, since we are limited with time, I would suggest each of you picks one other speaker and ask one question uh, for a particular speaker. So, uh, Beatrice, start the game. <laughs> okay, so I think one um, big challenge for us here in Brazil is getting the right uh, public policy, uh, especially to allow, for example, the reuse of waste materials. So how we can transform waste into raw materials. And I think uh, Joao mentioned a lot about the role of science, uh, the connection between uh, public and, and, and private. So do you have any experience on this type of work? How could we learn from, from Portugal in order to bring you know, the science to, to create patterns and guidelines and directives for the waste to be seen as a raw material and getting the public policy in place to allow uh, the material to be used in a safe way. Uh, and because just after that, that we will find the right financial equilibrium to close the loop and see materials in a different way. Thanks for so the question. Awesome. I will be very Dutch and direct again. Please be brief with questions and answers since we have 10 minutes for everything what we want to squeeze in. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Beatrice. Uh, in fact, it's a very uh, big challenge. Is the, when you talk about how it's possible, you reuse mess flows, and these mess flows as a raw material for other process, we have a, a barriers. A varies from regulation, from law, from uh, uh, politics. Uh, so in this moment, in Secular, we create a task, a task force with, with uh, from the academy professors and the senior researchers with the high experience in law regulation barriers to help design new policies, new regulation and new laws to support the transition of the capacity to tra transform re the reuse of the waste in raw materials. Uh, we take into account our experience, the two uh, big, uh, the two value chains with more uh, problem is the agro-food sector and the, the reuse of the nutrients for the land because the toxicity, because the, the security of the, the use of this the waste for uh, taking account of raw material. In agro-food sector, it's very complete, complicated. And in context of this nutrient cycle, because it's very important for the capacity and management of the land use, but taking account the reuse of these mass flows to put in the land, is, uh, it's not easy taking account the legislation and regulation from the example life program in European Union. It's a financial program oriented for the um, land use, the circular economy, but it's very important to the correct legislation and not only the correct legislation. Taking account or experience in Portugal, you need an independent entity to validation this disclassification of the waste to raw material. You need to create a independent entity and with capacity to answer of the demand of the market. It's my, my, my experience. Th thank you for, for that very interesting topic. I will give the floor now to Carolina, ladies first, uh, to ask question. You, you have your goldfish <laughs> to put in the pond. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So uh, my question is to Beatrice, actually. Uh, so uh, circular economy is uh, all about the collaborating uh, and uh, what and challenges that have been highlighted is, for example, that companies or different organizations feel that it can be difficult to col collaborate with one another. Uh, 
when they need like to open up and uh, tell about their challenges and plans. And many can be afraid of uh, revealing uh, too much sensitive information. Uh, have you uh, been looking into that and how have, have you been solving that challenge? <laughs> Yeah, that's, a, I think, um, a key element to transform uh, debates, discussion, roundtables, theory into practice. You know, quite often we see a lot of discussion groups, but uh, it's difficult to get, you know, hands on. The way we've done it, uh, we started with training, with webinars, as I said, is, and Guillermo pointed out, we need to build a trust in order for the companies to be confident that they will be sharing the information in a way that will be beneficial for the whole value chain. So we needed to build this. And the way we did this in our hub was to creating uh, engagement sessions, uh, getting the companies to start knowing each other um, and this is uh, relates to about in one year of work, we had about six webinars and 50 group meetings. So it takes time. Mm -hmm. But eventually, when we get that moment that everybody understand that there is a mutual benefit, and if everybody holds on to the information, we're not going to move forward. I think is is when we break the, you know, the, the really good point. And we, the, what we decided to do, we'd sign up a non-disclosure agreement. So we put forward uh, the opportunity in these subgroups. So we formed four subgroups. And in each subgroup, a small group of companies signed an NDA. And it was then in that point that we started to share actual uh, uh, confidential information in order to build the projects. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, very, very important. Again, back, back to trust and then how to organize this safe space for exchange. And Guillermo, you have your docker to ask question and then Daniel. <laughs> Thank you, Ladeya. Uh, I have a question for Daniel. Um, given that we've been uh, in similar processes over the, over the past few years to uh, move this transition forward in, in Latin America, um, what can you tell us about the process? I, for us, it's been very important. We always say the process is just important as the result. What can you can you delve a little bit deeper into the process of of doing uh, uh, that law of preparing it? How did you get all the different stakeholders involved? Uh, if you can talk a little bit more about that, Daniel. Thank you. I would say that the National Pact was an, uh, a very important milestone in this roadmap because, uh, as I said, uh, it, it, all sectors of civil society uh, can engage as a stakeholders uh, to handle of this roadmap. So uh, after the National Pact, many meetings, workshops were implemented to discuss the priority needs, the opportunities, the, the problems to resolve. And then uh, uh, all, all these things were inputs that were analyzed and now they have action plans in the uh, circular economy web paper. Uh, that was the, the, the base for the circular economy law that we have uh, nowadays. And all these stakeholders that are signatories for the national pact, are con uh, they, they, are, uh, they keep continued uh, in, in these discussions so uh, we have now uh, many institutions that uh, interact all time. We have the Circular Economy Foundation. Uh, recently, we have uh, this, the first uh, research in Circular Economy Center. And uh, uh, the academia, many universities, uh, they have the, their departments to research more, more, more and more about uh, waste management alternatives, uh, such as Beatrice said, uh, for to, to, to convert these materials to raw materials. So uh, I, I think this national path was the, I said, the, the, the very kickoff, the, the very kickoff of the of all this, this process. And we have these uh, stakeholders that are uh, continue uh, uh, talking, participating, 
and uh, uh, implementing the roadmap and, 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 the, and the new milestones in the circular economy law. Thank you so much. Here, I, I will have to conclude our discussion because the time is running out. But what we have learned as well, it, it doesn't matter whether we are those who are asking questions or those who are replying to questions. Both things are equally important and we should not stop asking questions. This is very important. So thank you very much for being brave and for being enthusiastic and to, for being so willing to share what you have learned on your journey. And as Dania nicely said, it's ongoing process. And once we will realize that if the cake is bigger, the whole cake, that even the slice that we take from this cake becomes bigger. So let's work jointly for this bigger cake and then our slices will be bigger as well. Thank you so much and uh, keep uh, staying in touch. And uh, I'm encouraging this exchange and the network governance as well as the role of transition brokers. Thanks a lot. And I'm giving the word now uh, to, the next, um, to the next panel and Claudia Teixeira is the one who is taking over the podium. So stay with us and Claudia, please, uh, the time is yours. I hope that Claudia is with us. Is she? I can see Claudia. Ah, yes. She is connected. Claudia? Yes. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> I'm not very good with Zoom. Normally, we work with um, another system. Okay, I'm very, very happy to be. Could you listen to me well? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. I'm very happy to be part of this event today in this select group engaged in circular economy. Also, I would like to thank the organized committee for the invitation to moderate this panel called Circular Business The Future of Living. It's a very huge theme. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting some of you and being in Porto last month, lightly in Ladeia and João Nunes. Beatriz brought me to you and I am very happy to be part of this event. It's very honored for me to be here today with you. I am sure we will learn a lot from our panelists in the second panel as well, dedicated to discussing secular business like the future of living. In order to make good use of the time and share some discussion between us and the audience, I am always worried about time because I normally speak a lot. I would like to conduct the panel as follows. I will start by introducing myself and then I invite each of you to make your considerations. I will not make any comments between the presentations. For me, I think it's better. At the end, I will make my comments and present some general questions for reflection between us, us and the audience. Feel free to answer it. Can you go this way, please? It's good for you. Okay. Well, my name is Claudia Teixeira. I am currently the Innovation and Business Direction at IPT, Institute for Intellect Technological Research of the State of Sao Paulo in Brazil. We are a public institution for providing technical, technical solution for industry, government, and society. And you know that technolo technology is part of the solution. When thinking about circular economy, we are engaged to help build innovation ecosystems and help build bridges, bridges with society, with the production sector, academia, to build applied projects. As you said on the first panel, we are you also need to create bridges between countries as well. For that, we created the Brazilian Center for Innovation in Economy, in Circular Economy, CBEC, to place at an online event in June in this year, making official the technical and scientific cooperation agreement signed between IPT and Exchange for Change Brazil. 
The center aims to make it easier to access to technological research, foster the implementation of the circular economic economy in national production chains, and attract investments to implement pilot and lar large scale circular economy projects. Another thing is very important for us, the Brazilian Center for Innovation in Circular Economy was born with international partnerships. Wow, <laughs> that's the, the, the reason I am here with uh, you today. IPT is Exchange for Change Brazil, signed a letter intended for international cooperation with Portuguese Collaborative Laboratory for, for the Circular Economy, Secolab, and the African Circular Economy Network, which brings together 21 countries, including South America, Angola, Egypt, and Nigeria. It's a very huge group also. To finish my presentation, I believe that the big challenge is my, my I believe on that, is to get all these stakeholders to build a circular business and that they are society, society, society fair, economically viable, and conserving the environment. Then, in my opinion, the principle of sustainable development must always be present in the circular business. I believe in that. Yeah, I know it's not easy to do this. <laughs> that it's the idea I'd like to, to put the discuss, discussion with you in this panel. Now, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Vladimir Gumilar. Yes. Vladimir is director from GAZ. International Circular Construction Initiative. But now I'd like to invite Mr. Vladimir to present his consideration. The floor is yours, Vladimir. Nice to meet you. Vladimir, how is it? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Nice you see my you. nice to see you, nice to meet you, nice to talk in front of such an uh, audience of believers and practitioners of circular economy. Uh, really looking forward uh, uh, to discussion. I would like to open the, the, the discussion in, in one particular field, this is built environment, uh, and present our initiative, the International Circle Construction Cluster. It's initiative. But I'm director of the construction cluster of Slovenia since 2004. So that's uh, the legal organization which is uh, supporting innovation for quite some years. Um, innovation brokers uh, are also called the clusters. So uh, the clusters are there for many years, for 20 plus years. So they have many, many, many uh, competencies of, of the transition brokers as presented by Ledea. Uh, couple of minutes back. Uh, so I think uh, we should exploit uh, this opportunity. Um, on the second, uh, second thing, it's, uh, which is something to, to, to know, it's the built environment is the, the largest, the largest change uh, seen or, or can, can be seen compared to pre-human uh, time. Uh, roads, cities. All, all, all that is there and it was not there before uh, the humans. But it has also a huge impact. Uh, uh, and we uh, look at the circul circularity gap report and check what is related to built environment, the housing, uh, social needs, and that's uh, marked in blue uh, uh, color. So this is the huge size. It's 50% of energy resources, uh, waste, everything is, is there if we uh, look uh, from the, the, the figures. So it's huge opportunity, but also huge responsibility for all the actors in, in this, uh, this uh, industrial uh, uh, field or many, many value chains which intersect uh, the built environment. Uh, it's global challenge as, as we heard today. So I, I will not talk about that. Uh, not much, uh, and I would like to say a few words about clusters. Uh, probably you're all familiar with them. There are like 7,000 clusters around the world. In Europe, 3,000 of them working hard. And by definition, they are believers. Firstly, in, in innovation, secondly, in collaboration, and now more or less also in transition to the digital circular economy. 
so we have to leverage on, on that for sure. And the uh, European Commission knows that. So they, they are strongly supporting the cluster uh, work, cluster development and, uh, and cluster uh, between cluster collaboration partnerships. Later on, I will talk about that a little bit. And uh, this is a huge pool of clusters which are presented here on, on the uh, ECCP uh, uh, platform. Uh, we have to work with them. We have to work with each other and we do, we do. Uh, for years now. So uh, this is not a problem because as I said, we are believer, believers in collaboration. Uh, what is important, uh, the, the clusters uh, used to be the uh, uh, triple helix, but now it's Pentagon and it co combines uh, the collaboration between, for example, dynamic SMEs, which are uh, the driver of economy, as Ladea said, then there, there is the science and research with need to communicate the research to the industry. There is <clears throat> policy creators and implementers, uh, the, the public sectors, and there is financing. We need uh, real, uh, real green financing, uh, not greenwashing. Uh, so uh, this is all, everything combined within the cluster and that's uh, by the definition. Uh, and what is uh, in terms of internationalization uh, important that we, are not exporting the circle solution anymore. We are sharing them. And that, that, that's uh, what we are, we are focusing on in our work and also in our international circle construction uh, cluster initiative. So sharing the circle solutions because we are solving our joint problem, our uh, joint planet. Uh, and th this reflects also in the mission. We would like to uh, make the uh, construction uh, sector uh, more circle, develop the, the market. And one of the means to do it is to promote the solutions which have to be doable. And this is the key message which is needed in our sector, which is a little bit traditional. So it is possible to, 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 do, to do it in a circular way. And that's what we are doing at the moment uh, with, within our uh, webinars. Um, currently, we are building the community of these believers in sector construction around the globe. Uh, and uh, you're invited to support us with a support statement and get in touch with me and other, other clusters in this initiative. Um, and besides the clusters, also other organizations are welcome. Uh, not only clusters are there, any, any, any type of organization which believes that collaboration over the border is the key for, for transition to a circular economy. In this case, uh, more or less built environment related industries. Um, currently, uh, we are working on how to organize ourselves uh, because this is international organization and this is new uh, think uh, it's not uh, association, but we would like to make it more like uh, sustainable or long term, and we, we need to define how to finance it, how to work together. Uh, now we know it's possible uh, due to COVID that that is a positive impact that we can work uh, uh, from our offices, from our homes, uh, with anybody around the globe, uh, and that's our let's say work at the moment. Uh, and that's called incubation phase. So we are uh, we are working hard to to go toward the uh, actual setup of the of this international cluster. And uh, we are, as already said, running the webinars uh, from uh, with presenters or or um, um, or people from different uh, parts of the world, from India, Africa, Italy, Germany, uh, Slovenia. Uh, and promote them uh, as much as possible uh, via social media. Uh, please follow us. Uh, the, the LinkedIn is the main channel of communication at the moment, and it's very active. And uh, I think a couple of hundreds of followers already there. Uh, and uh, before closing my presentation, we are also uh, actively involved in partnership of clusters in, in Europe. And currently, or we just started the partnership for internationalization called ICE Build, 
uh, which is supported by a COSME program. And one of the markets is also Brazil. And the objective is to support this sharing of, of circle uh, solutions, uh, circle building, uh, uh, circle extraction solutions in uh, beside Brazil also to Canada, India, uh, Emirates, and uh, and, uh, uh, and Mexico. So this is from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Now I would like to invite Sergio Leão, Director for Sustainability, IBRIC, Instituto Brasileiro de Autoregulação no Setor da Infraestrutura no Brasil. The floor is yours. Hi. Sergio, you there? Can you hear me, Sergio? Um, I don't see Sergio connected. Um, maybe you can skip and. Okay, the, the, next, next, the, one. the next one, yes. <laughs> Ricardo Bonfim Alves. You in the room? Hello. Yes. Hello, hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Ricardo Bonfim Alves is from Enel Italy, Brazil. The floor is yours. You can have your presentation. Okay. Thank you. I'm share, I will share a short presentation here. When you see, please tell me. Yes, yes. you can. Yeah. Okay, you can see. Okay, okay. But you can see the this slide, the future is circular, is it? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. Because uh, the, this, my screen uh, are a little crazy here, but okay, you can see the, the correct. So, Claudia, Beatriz, uh, and all the, the participants, thank you for, uh, for this invitation. It's a big pleasure to, to be here with, uh, with you. Uh, I, I try to, to explain very quickly some, some of our uh, experience here in, in New Brazil and why uh, we, we do these, these actions. So, First of all, uh, we, I'd like to start with this affirmative. The future is circular. For us, uh, when we talk our business, we are talking of uh, circularity, but not, not, not because uh, it's, it's a trend or it's a, a, a good, uh, a good uh, concept. Because for us, uh, when we think uh, how the, the big companies can work uh, today. We, we believe it's not uh, 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 only, only concept or on practice, practice uh, on project or uh, the, the concept that uh, address for on where on area or one directory. Uh, needs to be the way that we believe the business should work uh, and how can we look forward uh, uh, for the uh, for the market? So, uh, looking the the market scenario for us, the circularity is the only path to the long term survival because it could combine the the sustainability concepts and the the, the innovation concept. Uh, for uh, for us, uh, Eno was created a concept innovability. So uh, we, we want to be sustainable and want to be uh, innovative uh, and integrated. So when we look the, the circularity for us, we can do it uh, uh, not being innova uh, innovability uh, in our actions. So this is the first, uh, the first point. For the, the second point Sorry is- Sorry to interrupt, Ricardo. Maybe we have the same problem. We are seeing only one slide again. No, I yes, I, 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 I yeah, not I changed them. Okay. Ah, I'm assuming that, but I change. Oh, okay, I'm assuming the, the same slide. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the second point, when we talk the the energy sector, uh, now we are leaving the energy transition. But uh, when we look for the the computer, telephones, communications, uh, it's very clear the the the. The size of change that uh, that uh, rolled in the during the last years. 
But when, when we look at the energy sector, the, these changes are, are not so, so huge. But in the next, in the, the next year, but the next few years, we, are, we will live a very uh, huge revolution for this energy transition. So, uh, but when we talk the, this point, we can, we can think, uh, where we want to go, uh, which, uh, which is uh, our path, and what is progress? When we talk, uh, when we talk for the, the utilities, we, we have to, to talk this, this point. And look, the cities, the cities are, uh, have a, a very huge impact in different ways, not only the energy sector, but the transport, the, the construction point. But, so uh, many, many points. But uh, we can contest this. What, what is the pro progress? Which kind of cities we, we, we are living in? And we want to live in which, which kind of city? When we, we, we uh, think on it, circularity, it's a very uh, interesting uh, and fundamental tool to, to change it. But for Eno, it's, uh, it's important to think in a systemic way. So have an important met, met, uh, metric is, uh, and, and it's happening in different, different areas. So uh, I'll bring two examples uh, to present here today, the smart, C, the smart meters and the urban futurability. Uh, that's the, the, the smart meters, the key project here in Brazil when we talk about circularity for, for, for the Eno group. Uh, and it's because it's based on this technology. We can really experience the, the energy transition and this demonstration how much it, talking about circularity is talking about in different areas integrating to uh, and for create, for, uh, create a different view and a different uh, action. So uh, it started from circular front design. This, this equipment was totally designed to think the circularity, for, the, for instance, to, 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 to promote the, the recycled plastic for, from the grids, from the, the old meters, and from, uh, from the markets. We have, we have a real research for, for it. Uh, the design. Uh, Trying to extend of the uh, extend the, the life, uh, and we uh, we for sure we have contracts for the circular input in the, the manufacturing product uh, production. So uh, and also we try to work with the our value chain to produce pr for the production be more circular uh, uh, regarding our technical expect, uh, specification. So the other project is uh, urban futurability. The urban futurability, the, 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 it's happening in Vila Olimpia, a neighborhood from São Paulo, of São Paulo, and the largest living lab of the world and when we talk uh, about uh, en energy. Uh, we are implementing more than 40 technology uh, and testing it. Uh, the idea is uh, be more um, uh, promote the automation, efficiency, and uh, network if, uh, resilience, for instance. Uh, but with this, all of the sensor and the, the measurement, we will, we will have a, a big wave of that data that we can share it, for instance, with the, the municipality. And we, we can create a better, uh, better city uh, management because uh, sharing this, this, uh, this point, we for sure we have more opportunities to to be um, uh, to, to live in a more uh, circularity city. So, uh, however, when we aim the circularity, at the same time we we cross it for the the linearity for the uh, the linear economy. So uh, we try to to pass through it. Uh, building a circular city, uh, looking for our uh, our supply chain, uh, building different technical aspects, uh, specification, and promoting internal and externally uh, the the circular concept in the in our circular economy school, uh, and we are doing it with all of the the group in Latin in Central America, and for sure uh, 
uh, a good example is our position paper we are producing here uh, in Brazil uh, in partnership with Exchange for Chain and IPT. And the idea is uh, how can we have a different approach in the, in the society, promote the circularity and promote this discussion. Uh, in the end, we, we, we have a, propo uh, a purpose here to, to be open power, to, to, to tackle the, uh, the, the main challenge in the, the world. But uh, we believe, because we believe we can do uh, sustainable, innovative, and, cir and circular uh, uh, economy view uh, alone. We have to do it in a partnership. So let's do this together. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. No. Thank you, Ricardo. Now I'd like to know if, if Sergio is, Leo is there or not yet, Sergio? Well, then I would like, thank you, Ricardo, for our presentation. I would like to invite, now I have a little bit, a problem of the, the name, Mr. Matthew, Matthew Fegus, owner, donor from Slovenia. Will be there? No? No, the, 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 the last one is Dr. Andrea Kutnar in Renew Center of Excellence in Slovenia in Europe. Ah, there. Ah. Uh, hello. Nice oh. to meet you as well. Uh, so I will try to share my screen. I don't know, I sent the presentation in as well. So, but uh, if you cannot, I, I can share you. Yeah, yeah you, you manage, okay. Uh, okay. I manage, so, uh, uh, I will be like somehow presenting to you one of the projects that uh, we are just finishing at InnoRenew and it's a European Horizon 2020 project Wood Circus that is about the circular bioeconomy in the construction sector. And um, I would um, first emphasize that this is a very important topic when we are targeting the ambitious uh, goal of European Union to be climate neutral continent by 2050. And uh, European Green Deal is of course a base where we can be also searching for everything that needs to be done. And uh, the emphasis I would give is to resource efficiency. Because uh, we, as a, a, the name of the project already, Wood Circus is uh, demonstrating what is the material we work with. But still, it's not enough when we talk about the sustainability, about uh, the environmental impacts. We need to be uh, aware that we need to be efficient in using these materials. But for us, what was really important was that we saw that European Commission recognizing the wood as a building material, as an important actor when we are moving towards this ambitious goal. And it's not my intention to talk about the European uh, Bauhaus, the new European Bauhaus, which I think should be the top of one of the next presentations, but uh, when the, this initiative was launched by our president, she emphasized that the construction sector can be turned from a carbon source into a sink if organic building materials like wood are applied. And um, I completely agree with her and uh, with the new European Bauhaus, where we are also partners in, I believe we will be moving forward considerably. But when we talk about uh, wood use in the construction and resource efficiency, we also have to be aware that we need to be able to recycle these materials. And when we are using wood in constructions, we are also using a lot of fossil base materials like adhesives and coatings because until now we were always discussing about how to make wood as durable as possible so we were also like applying some um, materials that are not that uh, environmentally uh, friendly however uh, 
to be achieving the sustainability is reuse is what is important. And here I have a photo of a, a cross laminated timber. It's of course natural material, uh, carbon sink for sure. However, there are also uh, a lot of adhesives that we are using to make these products. And when we are talking about recircularity, we are aware we need to find solutions on how to be uh, uh, actually reusing this and how to make new products, new engineered products in the future in order to know how to recycle them at the end. And in the past, we were thinking about the use of materials already when we started planting the, the trees and I have here an example from the 18th century how the trees were pruned in order uh, to get the shapes that were needed in the Venetian Navy. Today, we are not doing it this way anymore. We, we are using uh, wood in products that uh, in the last few years, maybe some other materials were replacing it. However, one thing that is evident that we are doing is that we are going to multi-story timber. We are going higher and higher in uh, wooden constructions and we can be achieving this. However, then the question comes, do we have enough wood? Do we have enough wood that we can build all the cities out of the wood? Uh, we do, if we learn how to use different timber species, and uh, how to use maybe even a fast grown timber species in these engineered wood products that are enabling a high rise timber buildings. Uh, we can definitely introduce this new timber species and we can utilize them in the products. However, one thing that is a resource for us is that in the construction sector today, we have 70 million tons of wood waste annually, and only 33% of it, we are recycling it. This is what we need to be aware, that we need to be uh, finding ways of uh, reusing a material uh, in a new product, even if it is wood, which is natural renewable material. The uh, emphasis on circularity when we talk about the renewable materials is that the circle, the loop is closed. We can, of course, achieve circularity also with non-renewable materials, but there is the start and there is an end, which Additionally, is proving that we need to assure that the timber is being used in circular, circular, circular way and as many uh, in many circles as possible. Another aspect of when using the wood is the cascade utilization. So we can be using it in uh, boards, again, uh, first in beans, boards, and chemicals, and only at the end as energy. I won't go into details of this, but uh, to emphasize what's needed that we are actually achieving this circularity, we, even when it comes to renewable materials, we believe it's important that we approach it in interdisciplinary way and that we are using the natural resources in sensible way, achieving also the healthy built environment when it comes to the built environment and using timber in the constructions. And when we are constructing any building, not only wooden one, then there is also some waste that is being created. This waste during the construction is something that uh, shouldn't be treated as a waste, but actually as a resource. At Inno Renew, we were just recently completing our two days, that a week ago, we completed a building, a construction of a wooden building, the largest wooden building in Slovenia. And we tasked ourselves to actually calculate how much waste wood was created during the construction. 
And we then challenged the students of uh, arts, computer science, and sustainable built environment to, to work on a project of what they can build out of this waste food. Of course, this was just with the purpose that we are demonstrating the importance of utilizing the material. And when it comes to this re reverse logistic, is a very important aspect. So how to now use the recovered wood and how to bring it back into the factories. To improve the circularity and uh, as one of the uh, outputs of the wood circus project is uh, a fact that we need to start designing for deconstruction, that this will be increasing the use of reclaimed wood and we should start thinking that the buildings are just storage of materials, which means that we are actually increasing the value of the material for the next cycle. And uh, we uh, believe that uh, in order to really get this into the economy, into the society, that this design for this assembly uh, also needs to uh, be followed with the development of solutions for reverse logistics and of course development of technology solutions how to clean reprocess and to reintroduce the reclaimed timber in a, a new building or other materials with that i would just like to invite you to come visit us and one of the opportunities is the wood rice conference uh, that we are hosting next september in slovenia where we will be gathering industry and experts scientists re, uh, that are approaching the tall timber buildings in a holistic way uh, approaching it in including the design for disassembly or circularity and with that, thank you very much. I hope it was not too long. No, no, it's a good, thank you, Andresia. Now I know if Sergio Leão is on the room. Yes, he already connected. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I apologize for being late. I sort of a bit, uh, uh, understood the timing here, so I had some trouble in getting on and late and initially also my name was under Beatrice, but thank you all for providing the corrections. Uh, I would like to thank the arrangements for this meeting and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here on behalf of IBRIC. I'll explain a little bit in a few minutes and where we stay. We are at the very beginning of an institute in Brazil, but I think it's uh, hopeful and uh, we've been discussing with Beatriz especially specifically here several of our approaches that we could find a common ground together. IBRIC is an institute formed in 2019 uh, from the initial work of a group of companies in the infrastructure sector, uh, mainly in engineering, in civil and in, in engineering and construction, and uh, with the support of three uh, institutes in Brazil, what we call the facilitators of the process. They, 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 they were the IFC branch in Brazil, belonging to the World Bank, uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation, uh, the ethics group uh, lead, uh, under the law school at Getulio Vargas Foundation, and also uh, Ethos Institute, which is an institute in Brazil dedicated to good practices in transparency, ethics, and uh, environment, and so on. So these three institutes, uh, these three institutions, plus a group of companies and a group of people, decided in, in 2019 developed a series of discussions how to model uh, an, an organization that could support the development of uh, self-regulation in infrastructure. We know that uh, companies especially the large companies uh, in infrastructure have moved away ahead uh, with their plans and preparation and organization is structured themselves for integrity, transparency, especially after the last few years, uh, after the, all the detailed investigation that occurred in Brazil, a group of companies said, well, we have to uh, move ahead of the, what's called the uh, legal framework. We have to be ahead of them. 
and uh, let's try and let's put together a plan for self-regulation. So that was the initial idea in 2019. Uh, we, for several months, discussed the organization, the, the, the objectives, how we would structure the institute. Finally, in October 2019, we established uh, our, our, our formal institute. Of course, last year was a, a, a year of a lot of work, but also suffered from the, that, all the uh, situation of the pandemic. But IBRIC is a reality now. So we have established ourselves, not only as a group now with the infrastructure companies looking for moving ahead with self-regulation in integrity, ethics, and transparency, but also, and very importantly, in ESG, and our, and, and our environmental, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's say, uh, uh, structures. So uh, we then move uh, beyond the engineering and construction group. And uh, by late 2020, a group of companies that had initially set an agreement with uh, uh, the, the Global Compact and the Atos Institute, what they call the a business pact for integrity, they decided they would uh, conduct their work through a brick. So we have now this uh, main group of infrastructure, engineering, construction, but also a substantial group of large companies and the main companies in Brazil in uh, urban cleaning and uh, urban uh, waste and effluent. And, um, and they moved their uh, group so they would conduct uh, what they call the self-regulation proposal through IBRIC. So IBRIC now is established. We developed uh, our, it's a still a small institute in terms of structure, but we are uh, together with these two groups of companies. Now, where are we now? We propose that through main two committees, and IBRIC is not a, an institute that is proposing regulations. It's working with the companies that start, they, that formed a brick, and together we are developing what we call the self-regulation self proposal for this set of groups of companies, but also for their suppliers, their uh, partners, so that they could move beyond the brick and reach a larger number of groups. So we also have participating at our institute a set of organizations that congregate uh, let's say engineering and uh, waste and residue and, uh, and, and waste companies. So they, they are like, like say, they spreading uh, branches of IBRIC for their uh, operations. So at right now, these two committees, one in integrity and ethics and transparency work in best practices that they could move uh, uh, beyond what they call legal, legal re requirements and apply self-regulation to their business uh, areas. And another one, the second one in ESG, uh, which is an interest of how these companies should move ahead and, uh, and apply to themselves the self-regulation in ESG. Uh, and in this second branch here, that's where we uh, touch uh, fuels, what we've been discussing here, because in ESG, a lot of uh, questions, especially regarding engineering and construction, is on circularity and how do you handle the large amount of waste that civil construction usually handles. Of course, the waste companies are dealing themselves, but they are working for uh, usually with the public sector, uh, like in main cities in Sao Paulo and other uh, cities in Brazil. And they are improving their systems, but uh, one of them is how to uh, minimize and how to reuse, and it's within their own schedule of contracting with the public sector. But also on the civil construction is a main opportunity where, because these companies are saying, we have to move by ourselves as self-regulatory. We are not only complying with the law, but we are proposing additional rules. So that's where we've uh, been discussing with Beatriz and their the, uh, exchange for change so that we find these common points between civil construction and circularity in general. And, and that's where we, the second committee in ESG and environment is involved in developing best practice. Right now we are structuring so that we can uh, say to, uh, to other companies where 
should be a guideline, best practices and guidelines for them. I'll, see, I'll, I'll finish just finishing an example. A large a number of companies in Brazil, mostly medium and small companies, are those that provide road work uh, maintenance for public sectors. And they are a, a very large number of companies, but usually from the medium to small size, and they work all over the country. So they have an organization called ANEOR, which is the National Organization for Highway uh, uh, Construction Companies. And they approached us, said, we want to partner with the BRICS so that we could develop some self-regulation because most of the companies say, how are we going to prepare ourselves? Which standards do we have to apply? Uh, could you give us some, uh, let's say, guidance on this? So. Uh, our reply is, okay, we, we come to, you come to a brick and we work together. It's not a brick offering you, but you will be part of the solution. So we develop together. So with ANEOR, a set of companies on self-regulation for uh, environment and also ethics and integrity. So this is where opportunity lies. Uh, CC Bricks is still recent. We cannot have a, we still don't have a final product at this moment, but we look forward and are very hopeful that it's this, this group of companies wish to improve their practices, to become, uh, let's say, up, or, or upgrade themselves to uh, so that they, 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 they could reach other contracts with uh, larger sizes or other customers or other clients. So uh, how do we help them to improve these best practices? And I think that's where circular opportunities come to through. So uh, if I'll put in my uh, share screen here, just a sign of the brick so that you could see our... Okay, e brick now is, is on the screen and... Uh, it's called the Brazilian Institute for Self-Regulation in this in the sector of infrastructure. Of course, we see infrastructure as a main as several segments. We have energy, we have transportation, we have civil engineering construction, we have solid waste and uh, waste companies, and now these small and, and medium-sized construction companies. But we are actually at this moment developing what we call IBRIC proposal for ESG agenda for two, 2021 and beyond, We're moving from now on and beyond. So that's where I, I think the opportunity lies for uh, bringing the term circularity to these companies, because they, in a way, they, uh, the question is, how can you give us some support so that we move and we stay uh, we are assured that this is a, a, a proper movement, not just to sign an agreement, but also to improve our practices. So I'll stop here, but I'll present, this is, Ibrik is, is on a site. Uh, I'll put it on, on the chat here, but uh, you could see that uh, how we are evolving uh, towards this uh, theme that we uh, uh, Beatrice asked me to explain how he break explaining to explaining to work with the companies. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Julian. I, I think it's better to start the debate and I have some questions, general questions for all of you. The first one, so I think questions. How will a zero emission Europe impact the world market? How your zero emission in Europe impact the world business or your market? May I start sure. quickly? Uh, it's a very, very important point when we talk uh, uh, our our activities. Uh, some part of our uh, purchase uh, happen. Uh, integrated with your uh, annual holding, so uh, we we can um, we can participate of tech of technical specifications for the, the all the group in the world and also here in Brazil. So uh, the the intention is um, align our uh, year by year our uh, procurement area to produce uh, contracts. And produce uh, uh, 
some kind of uh, tenders that promote circularity. The uh, for it for it, for this we uh, we uh, develop a as we name it a key factor. This key factor is a, a bonus in the contract that for the the the, the supplier that pr present uh, circular projects in the manufacturing, on the product, or with the community in the, in, for the, the tender that they, they, part, they, they are uh, part, part in, uh, in, the, in the role. So the, the idea is uh, and with our size of purchase uh, and with our strategy, uh, not here in Brazil, but also uh, in, with our holding colleagues, integrate the, the, the purchase to promote the circularity. Thank you, Claudia. Thank um, you. If I can can add something uh, in this uh, uh, regard, uh, I think somebody has to be first. <laughs> That's something. Uh, somebody has to start uh, going in this direction. Uh, and what is important in, in the sector, as I said in the presentation, is that uh, the businesses must know that this is it is possible. You know. Uh, they must believe that this is possible and it's also economically viable. That, that's the second thing, you know, uh, that this is not uh, some strange business, but should be part of the regular business in the near future, and not in the distant future. So all best practices and actual implementation of circularity and zero waste, zero emissions, zero carbon, should be spread around the globe. And doesn't mean that this is done firstly and mainly by EU. It's happening all around the globe and we have to learn from each other. Maybe some solutions are implemented in, in Africa because they are thinking a little bit differently out of scope, out of window. Uh, and we a little bit forget about that. Uh, 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 in the last presentation uh, uh, was said, this regulation is what dictates what we do, you know, in, in the construction business. And we don't think above or uh, uh, over that regulation. So this self-regulation as, as was presented right now is a perfect thing, you know. We have to go beyond regulation because this is the minimum require, requirement uh, somebody defined probably many years ago, and this is just not enough. Um, Claudia, you are mute. Uh, in another, in the, the same way, huh? do you think that the only way to have an economically viable reuse system is through legislation? Use system. For no. example, how to use recycling and other recycling materials. You need also only the legislation for that. We can do this. Uh, no, I said many times uh, yesterday and today, it's about uh, different thinking and different approach. And you know, it's about believing into green future in better future for our children. It's not about, you know, going close to the, 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 the minimum requirement. So this is, as I said, not enough, you know. So if you uh, put these requirements higher, it's a little bit better, but it's still not enough because the requirements would be for all and that should, we should go beyond and think all the time going beyond that, that, that borders of regulation, at least in construction sector, which is really, you know, uh, depending on, on, the, on the technical regulation in many fields. And this is what we measure our performance against and, uh, I think uh, we should go beyond and this self-regulation, sustainability-related, uh, you know, indicators of, of success should be embedded in, in businesses. And this, this, this is depending on the, on the believing part of the humans running the, the businesses. Okay. I'd like, uh, Andreja, could you? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. It's I a comment on this. You. Yes, I uh, like the, the first one is like, uh, if we were many years ago going towards globalization, then now we are in the opposite direction. We are going to go to a more localized uh, utilization of resources. Uh, so this will, of course, cause a lot of shakes on the markets, I would, I would say. Uh, but probably the society is still not ready including us who are talking about this, who are promoting the circularity and the use of the or efficient use of resources. So we need to make a lot of efforts, not only on the legislation level, but also in awareness raising among the citizens in Europe or in Brazil or any other country in order to, to achieve the ambitions. And I would say that uh, we are aware, and I think I'm not the, <laughs> the only one, that we are not going to save the planet if only Europe becomes climate neutral. So we need to do it uh, in all continents. And that's uh, what I find it important that we are communicating and learning from one another. Okay, thank you. Claudia, um, sure. please co considering that we have, um, we have 10 minutes more before we close this panel. Um, could you please um, pass the floor to Mr. Matej Fegus, Hi, yeah. owner of Don... Yeah, he just joined us. Okay. Uh, and he's the owner of Donar in Slovenia. Please. Okay, please. Hi. Nice to meet you, everybody. Um, um, from Slovenia, company Donar, um, I would say we are one of the key actors in uh, industry, how to transition to circular economy, but not just that, also using uh, sustainable design thinking models and uh, zero waste. And I would welcome you all in this conversation, how we can change our actions to a better future. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Would you like to share um, any presentation? <laughs> Mr. Matu? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. um, um, I, I can share a presentation, but I think that would be too, too long for you because uh, what I can show you is a case study that we are working on in our own company. So what we are, if you're interested, I have no problems sharing that. Well, you, you, you well, have uh, five minutes, uh, if you wish. I don't know if it's enough, yeah, yeah. five to seven minutes. Okay. But you have uh, some questions for the audience also. Yeah. Yeah, the okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I cannot share because uh, I would uh, have to be a co-host to do that. So. I guess we move on and uh, we fix that and we can do that later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Goros, or could you? Yes, thank you very much um, for, a, for a great um, panel. Thank you very much, Claudia, for, for leading it. Uh, my question was actually to uh, Mrs. Dr. Kutner um, uh, from the project Inner and Renew. Um, and I was, Provoked what she said about the uh, uh, local and global um, value chains, if I understood them right, because we spent some time yesterday talking about the material flows in this new circular world, and I'm just um, I'm interested um, how, how does she see the material flow in terms of if material is good, you know, um, because obviously I sit here in Brasilia where there's a lot of attention on deforestation, managing wood, sustainable management of wood, um, production, processing, extraction, and all that. Um, so how does the circularity in wood, um, in wood extracting, um, processing, and manufacturing affect the global value chains? Um, and are, is this really a move towards local? Is that simple, or uh, could she elaborate a bit on that? Thank you very much. Yeah, well, it's, uh, of course, uh, 
think I could answer again that it's two ways. One is policy, the other one is the society. When the person who at the end uses the product will be aware that uh, it's important where this piece of wood came from and that it was from the sustainably managed forest and uh, how far it had to travel that it came to his house, this will impact at the end also these uh, movements on the global markets. Uh, of course, on the other hand, we are also aware certain uh, species that are grown maybe in Slovenia, they're not suitable for certain purposes. And now the question is either we are going and developing new modification technologies, which, uh, with which we can be turning Slovenian wood into a material that is needed for a certain application. And how much is actually our environmental impact when it comes to this, or we are shipping it across the ocean and uh, use that one. But of course, in each case, it needs to be sustainably managed forest. And this is uh, a very important debate. And uh, on, I believe on the political level, this is very clear. Everyone is like uh, being aware of it, but the society, the ones that, that, that at the end buy the product, they need to be aware. And I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, it's not an easy one <laughs> to answer, I would say. Uh, May I add one question to this as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is uh, so interesting, uh, Andrea, to hear everything. I, I'm a fan of Inner Renew and of everything what you are working on, uh, to be honest. Uh, but I'm wondering now when you mentioned this a local perspective of something else, what is typical for Slovenia, but I would say for Europe, I don't know how it is in Latin America, but uh, talking about building environment and all the buildings that are already there, so they are banks of materials. So how do you see that to use these banks of materials for the future development of the built environment? Yeah, well, this is a very important part. And also uh, we are dealing with this and we are searching for solutions of this renovation wave, I would say. And maybe this is one thing I also am not so familiar with the Latin America, but like in Europe, uh, anything that is 50 years old is a cultural heritage. So when we come to uh, renovating this building stock, we need to do it in a way that we also preserve this cultural heritage. And uh, so it is, of course, a very big shift needed that we do not build for centuries anymore, but we build for a, a certain time frame. But this is going in the new construction. But when it comes to the old ones, we need to assure that we renovate them with renewable materials, but in a way that we also preserve the, the heritage. And uh, the recycling then, uh, that of course it's at different levels of the materials and this, uh, the, uh, the age of the buildings that we are uh, renovating, but uh, the building stock and decarbonization of the building stock is a huge topic that we need to find solutions, how to actually decrease the uh, environmental impact of buildings when they are in use and not only the new ones but also the the old ones especially what we have very rich <laughs> I would say building stock in Europe on is the cultural heritage buildings uh, that needs to be preserved and of course at the same time turned into buildings that uh, are uh, energy efficient and resource efficient. Thank you so much. I think I need to close the panel because the time is finished. Thank you so much for the opportunity and so much for uh, uh, for the contribute with this panel. It's a very nice uh, discussion. Thank you. Bye. Now, yes, now we are moving to the last part uh, of uh, today's program. So another Teixeira, we have the uh, great honor to welcome Dr. Isabella Teixeira this time to give us an overview of what has been shared, not only in this last panel, but over the day and maybe even to refer 
to some uh, takeaways of the day one. So please, uh, the screen is yours. God, thank you very much, Ladija. It's nice to see you again, my dear friend. And uh, good morning, good afternoon you know, from Brazil. I'm sorry because I was not possible to join before, but uh, I'm very honored to be invited to join you today and uh, to share some perspectives considering circular economy and the big picture that, in my opinion, we will face uh, the next 10 years and probably in the next 30 years. It's not only climate change, but I think that uh, this debate is absolutely important considering uh, two important worlds. Uh, governance and scale. This is to act, we need to have governance and we need to understand the scale, okay? Even to address local needs and considering global core benefits. So I'd like to uh, welcome this uh, opportunity, Ambassador Galhart, considered Latin American European dialogues. You know that we have some tensions, political tensions today. Uh, but that's based on our common interest. I'm sure about this, okay? And I'm sure that circular economies also uh, will play or should play an important political role to facilitate and to, to facilitate how we can come together based on the future, not necessarily based on the mistakes of the past, okay? So I think that uh, I know that yesterday, uh, my friend Yanis Potocin, uh, was here. I was there in the International Resource Panel meeting, <laughs> chairing the meeting, <laughs> and uh, but he shared with me some uh, perspectives also today during during our second day of, of our meeting. But I'd like uh, uh, to say that uh, I think that uh, uh, as your uh, the Slovenian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Minister, Mr. Bogdan Bakti, I'm not sure if I can pronounce right, okay? I do apologize. But Rajiva, uh, you perfectly will stay shaded, don't you worry, okay? Uh, said, summarized yesterday, transition to the circular economy, not, not, not only transition to the circular economy, transition to a better world, a fair world, cannot be achieved if not, it's a if it's not a global initiative. Why you mention global? Because you have global problems, global crises, and you need global solutions, but not necessarily framed based on global perspectives. We need to understand, as mentioned before, how local needs and local dynamics will should come or must come uh, to address concretely robust and, and permanent solutions considering development and the, the new relationship between human humanity and nature. As uh, I know that Jan has mentioned yesterday that you need to learn how to grow with nature, not against nature. And this is very important because this is not new, but indeed I'm my feeling and based on my experience that we knew about this instinctively, but we like to postpone this every time and don't have time to postpone anymore. This is something very important to be observed. Uh, I'd like to highlight here two or three things and the digits will agree, will agree with me. The first one is the context of this debate. So you have a global process that's happening and I'd like, I'd like to highlight some process for a big picture consider next year. And this year and the next year. I, th I think that these two years, uh, they're very important to understand better how we go, how we move forward until 2025 and also 2030. But I think that you cannot forget that you have two important multilateral process and progress. This is a biodiverse convention, conference of parts. You know that you have you have the second part and that's April in China, and the last the first one was last October, and you has also the process post Glasgow. This is not only Glasgow. So <laughs> this is very important because the trajectory uh, that probably uh, we have to be promoted and to move into uh, uh, from Glasgow to Egypt and also considered 2025. It's very important to observe how we'll do this. And more than this, uh, if uh, you need to understand something that I observed in, in Glasgow. If you have nature, and I know that you mentioned nature here before, and I know that we're looking for a nature positive approach considering circular economy. It's true and it's important, but if you have nature at the table in the, conf in the conference rooms in COP26, you had inequity and inequalities in the streets of Glasgow. 
it's very important to understand how the movements of human rights, uh, climate rights, migrations, natural resources, etc., etc., they will come. This is not linear. We are fully dedicated to this in the natural resource panel today, except we're looking forward to understand better how natural resource and mobility or immobility and also migrations will come together or not. And uh, in the next year, also we have Stockholm Plus Fifth Conference, conference uh, rethinking, uh, not in my opinion, my personal opinion, my approach as an ambassador of this global civil society process to join the complex fifth council conference, we are looking forward to understand better planetary boundaries and how to be planetary, not be global. Okay, global, it's a self centered issue uh, or concept, and we need to understand how, if you need a new relationship between human, humanity and nature, is this ever, circular economy is also based on this and political perspectives, we need to understand how we be connect, consider nature. So local needs, as, as, as was mentioned before, localized resource use, this is very important, but we need to understand the dynamics, the connection that nature promotes us, or conduce us, or drive us, and indeed how be planetary. We assume probably a new political, new political, we demand new political skills uh, in, the, in this decade. This is very important. Why? Because the Stockholm Plus 50 also address UNEP Plus 50. After 50 years that we have UNEP, okay, and the environmental, environmental multilateralism, this will be probably renewed. This I'm sure that will be renewed, refreshed. We have the, our common agenda from the Secretary General of Nine Nations and also other documents that are coming considering environmental governance. Uh, I myself am fully engaged in the debate uh, about environmental governance and environmental multilateralism in Latin American and Caribbean countries. And this is very important to be observed because we have to address the triple environmental crisis that uh, as a concept was adopted uh, last September. And we are mentioned not only climate change, but biodiversity loss and pollution and, and degradation. So uh, cannot forget also that next year we have an AIA 5.2. So the Global Assembly or the Environmental uh, uh, Global Assembly to discuss exactly uh, uh, this new big issue, this new moment of a big issue that's governance. So we need to understand this better because you, if you want uh, circular change, and I do believe that we want this. And also, you cannot forget to add a final, uh, a final uh, uh, ingredient, you can say this, Sustainable Development Goals and, and Human Development Index that comes not only based, uh, as the, based on the perspective of the past, the past means five years ago, six years ago, but also considering how to move forward and remembering that uh, uh, Human Development Index uh, finally uh, uh, adopt the environmental concerns, environmental perspectives into the metrics. Okay, this is very interesting how the things are coming. Why I mentioned this, this big picture? Because you need to connect things. If you want to go into the political world and you want to go uh, into the policymakers process, if you want to go to deal based on realities. And in my personal experience, I understand my second point that we need ambition to change. We not only need to change, we need ambition to change. And this is something very important because Ambition, uh, it's also a concept that's full related to national conditions and also cultural aspects and also uh, 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 handicaps, uh, development handicaps that you used to have, especially in emerging and developing economies. You cannot forget this because ambition is something that everyone should be motivated, but we must be clear step by step how to address concrete solutions based on ambition. So, for me, it's key uh, politically that you, can, you need to have ambition to change. And my third point is that I fully agree. Now I think that the uh, uh, ambassador uh, of Slovenia in Brazil will love this, that uh, I am sure that circular economy is key to tackle the triple environmental crisis, but not only, on, not only climate one. But I agree with you that uh, there is no low carbon future without circular economy. Also, there is no 1.5 Celsius degree without Amazon standing up. It's very important to observe this because we need to discuss climate security and 
resource efficiency is part of this equation also. So how the things are connecting today, this new political dynamics around the world is something that in my opinion is absolutely fascinating, but it's very, very hard because you need to have the co-players or the multi-stakeholders approach, private sector with different language, different demands, civil society, blah, 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 come into different rooms or the common rooms to address concrete and share perspectives. And then I'm going now to the, the last point that I'd like to address here. I know that we had five panels who have really huge debates here. I know that we have contributions from different countries like Slovenia and Brazil, Argentina, Chile, also uh, Finland, Colombia, Netherlands. Very good. Okay, excellent. But we need more. And we need to be ambitious. <laughs> To have more. And I used to say something that uh, my friends in Brazil uh, sometimes look at me for what is this? I, I, I am a pragmatic woman, really. I think that Lajiz is the same. Uh, uh, I'm pragmatic and rational, but I have big, big dreams. And this is fantastic. We need to have dreams. To have ambition, we need to desire or to have the political will for the future. And for this, we need to bring the future to the present. If we're not able to do this, we are, again, we understand the future as a linear project of the past. This is not true. Or something that we need to postpone. You cannot postpone anything anymore because nature is saying it's end. Okay, it's over. And I think that among these common conclusions that arose, our roles on the panels, et cetera, uh, three things uh, means for me very important. Consumption and production, this new uh, perspective of sustainable consumption produ production, you have new perspective coming from one planet and together with the National Resource Panel, it's very interesting. It's not only value chains, but more than this, we need to understand how to dec decouple is essential, but indeed how to go into the choice not only based on non-consumers, but out we go into the extraction phase or extracting phase to understand better how production is, must be better managed to be efficient in natural resource use. I think that uh, considering international cooperation, I fully agree. I know that to manage these issues, and this is very important, cannot uh, uh, move forward without co international cooperation, but we need to dialogue. Dialogue, dialogue, Dialogue. Dialogue. It's not something that to have a speech and to have a plenary that is there and agree or not agree. Dialogue. Politically, dialogue. This means that we need to sit at the table together. This means that we need to understand our difference. This means that we need to share our handicaps. This means that we need to be affirmative and assertive that you have consensus or not necessarily consensus convergence process that you can manage together. So my feeling is that circular economy, it's a good, a good, I don't know if a, a password, I prefer an algorithm for this equation to have a new, to reframe a circular economy and sorry, to reframe international cooperation in Latin America, consider the uh, North and South cooperation, but don't forget the East and Western world that's coming together today. And this is very important to observe because we have the, what I like to say, the green global South. And they have a really big challenge coming. And it's fascinating how we need to reshape things. And for this, we need dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. And then my last point here, of course, that I cannot uh, put this aside or let this aside is the governance of a circular economy. It's a country specific, I agree, but you need to understand how we connect internationally. And for this, in my opinion, I think that the frame that climate agenda uh, uh, consolidate or agreed based on the national NDCs and also regional ones probably will allow us to understand better how circular economy should come into the national development uh, national development plans and also how you can use better circular economy as concrete solutions to address climate and biodiversity climate crisis and the biodiversity and the pollution price together. So it's three important I think that this tool uh, like NDC, this is very important because this will demand on climate agenda, regulation, and governance. And we need to pay attention to what is happening the next steps. That's why I mentioned the next two or three years post Glasgow, this trajectory, exactly to make clear that you can have circular economy as a strategic player to make the difference in the right direction. So my recommendation here is not to only come together, but more than this, we need to avoid that the leakages, the political leakages that used to have, we need coherence 
and the need to be together to have careers among public policies and, and, and also among international interests. So finally, I'd like to mention uh, what my friend Yanis Votochny uh, said. We know that resource constraints are affecting the well-being of the world's population. We know everything that we as scientists, as International Resource Panel, we are sharing other foundations that work together with us also sharing. We understand this, but, but in my perspective, we are going, probably humanity is not looking for the new relationship, we have to looking for a new relationship between humanity and nature, but we need to address well-being and lifestyles. This probably will emerge in new metrics the response that people around the world, the different societies we're, look, we're looking for, etc. how we can live better, safe, and together with a really, really good relationship with nature. This means probably the effect post-pandemic crisis, we cannot forget it, and probably uh, we need to understand better the whole of circular economy to support countries and society to address inequalities and looking for equity. Inequalities, equalities is different from equities, and if you need to understand in a world with constraint of natural resource, how, how we will host these concepts and how we will address the future into the present. So I think that was a really, uh, an amazing debate, all the inputs and summarize that I received from my staff. And uh, don't forget, be ambitious and change. Let's do it together. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank Magician. you, Bye -bye. Uh, What a great speech as always. One big applause. <laughs> and if we would have John Lennon, he would sing the song, Imagine. <laughs> I guess that that was in your message that we should imagine the future because without imagining the future, we cannot co-create it. And as you said nicely, we should dare to dream. So without dreams, innovation cannot happen, creation cannot happen, and we need this ambition to change, but not to change others, but first to yeah, change ourselves. ourselves, our habits, our behavior, our lifestyle. And then the well being will be our reality. So, thank you so much for this strong message. And I will give the word now to someone who will conclude these two fruitful days. This is Mr. Bogdan Batic. Uh, please, after all that, uh, we would need another hour for wrap up, but I believe that you have a few minutes to uh, let us. Uh, yeah, to inspire us to keep on going and working on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Ladea. Um, before I pass the word to um, Dr. Bogdan, uh, just in behalf of the ULAC Foundation, um, I would like to um, pronounce some final words. Um, first, I'd like to um, thanks again, the co-organizers of uh, this wonderful event. Um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, from Slovenia, the Exchange for Change Brazil, the Circular Change from Slovenia, uh, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, and the Brazilian Center for International Relations, um, SEBRI. Uh, we have gathered over these two days of a seven hours uh, webinar with around 30 high level panelists from government representatives, international organizations, civil society organizations, think tanks, university, and the private sector. And, and the main message and conclusions that we got from these uh, high-level panelists will be consolidated uh, in a report that we hope to share with all of, all of you, the participants, and the general public um, before the end of this year. And of course, uh, and also the, the video that uh, is being recorded and the PowerPoint presentations that uh, some of the panelists um, present and during this, uh, these two days. And of course, uh, we plan to continue working um, around uh, and towards promoting circular partnerships in the forthcoming um, year. Um, as the executive director of the OLAC Foundation um, commented yesterday, this event comes at a very um, opportune, very um, a good moment just after the Glasgow. And, but uh, overall, or above all, it comes uh, at a time uh, when the dialogue between the European Union and the Latin American, the Caribbean, um, is being relaunched. 
uh, with the recent trip, for example, of the high representative and vice presidents of uh, the European Union, uh, Joseph Borrell, to Peru and to Brazil. And uh, uh, as announced yesterday by one of the panelists, um, Javier Nino Perez, with the mini summit uh, between the two regions that is being scheduled for the 2nd December. On the agenda of this uh, renewed dialogue between European Union and Latin American and Caribbean, there are three priorities uh, themes. One of the themes is the green recovery in which this uh, seminar of circular economy is part of, is framed. The other is the digital transition, which in some way is uh, interlinked uh, with the, 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 eco the circular economy discussion as we could see in some of the, the debates over these two days. And the third uh, theme, which is the priority of this uh, bi-regional dialogue is social cohesion. And regarding the latter, and uh, taking the opportunity for um, the words that Isabella Teixeira just mentioned about um, social inclusion, inequality, uh, we would like to take the opportunity to invite all of you for the next week's uh, webinar that we will be also holding in cooperation with the Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia, as well as with the European External Action Service and with the European Commission uh, Director General for International Partnerships, uh, Partnerships, DG INPA, and the OECD Development Center. Um, this webinar, I will quickly share with you uh, the banner, but this will be posted um, in our uh, social media uh, and social networks, and is already in our uh, website uh, for 1st December. Uh, we'll be touching about the recovery as an opportunity for transformative social change, pathways towards a new lag partnership for cohesive societies. So just with this, I would like to um, uh, conclude my remarks that for us, ULAC Foundation, it has been a very, very um, pleasure uh, to have uh, organized this event on circular economy. And this next one, <coughs> sorry, with the government of Slovenia within their presidency over the EU Council. And now I, I would like to pass the floor to the director Bogdan to, to conclude this webinar. Um, the, the floor is yours, uh, director Bogdan. Um, yes, thank you, Ernesto. Esteemed panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues from the EULAC Foundation, um, amigas y amigos de América Latina y de Europa, um, it is a pleasure to join you again on the second day at the end of this dynamic, valuable, and fruitful discussion on circular economy. I believe we did some networking and exchanged views and experiences with circular economy in many countries in both regions, the European Union and Latin America. I would like to thank the panelists for their contributions, as well as many participants of the seminar who joined us directly or via social media platforms. As we heard, the European Union and Latin American and Caribbean countries are among the front runners in pursuing a profound transformation from extractive linear economic model to a regenerative circular one that can help preserve the planet and its natural resources for future generations. This complex transition needs to happen on multiple levels and within all of government and all of society approach. This seminar gathered the like-minded stakeholders from both regions, and we know that we will all need to reach out to those who are yet to be converted. This transformation must be global to succeed. However, there is no global template. Each country must develop its own specific approach, its own roadmap. But we can still exchange experiences and learn from each other about good practices that can replicate and be scaled up and also about mistakes that we should be avoiding. As mentioned before, Slovenia has been addressing the circular economy and cooperation in this field with Latin America and Caribbean already since 2018. 
the year when we adopted our own circular economy roadmap. Today, we are happy that as the current presidency of the Council of the European Union, we can announce the intention of the European Union to request to join the Latin America and Caribbean Regional Coalition on Circular Economy. This important decision has been adopted by the Council of the European Union today. Allow me to conclude with our sincere thanks to partners by this event, especially the EULAC Foundation, as well as the several circular economy platforms from both regions, Exchange for Change, Circular Change Institute for Circular Economy, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, and with the Brazilian Center for International Relations. I would particularly like to thank my colleagues at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, especially Irena Grill, but also Ambassador Goras Trenčel. I hope to be able to welcome you all in Slovenia one day soon. Among other green achievements, Slovenia is the second country in Europe in terms of forest cover and has made important gains in reforestation and forest management. I believe Ernesto already mentioned the opportunity of the next bi-regional seminar on social cohesion on the 1st of December. So let me just thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias. Obrigado.